everyone. We wanted to tell you about a new show we are loving, the Culture Study Podcast with Anne Helen Peterson. It's a show about exploring the nooks and crannies of the culture that surrounds you. Each week, Anne and a super smart co-host answer listeners' questions about the stuff they find interesting and perplexing, like, why do clothes suck now? Is Paw Patrol copaganda or is it not that deep? And what's the deal with everyone I know getting a divorce? Like Anne's tremendously popular newsletter, the Culture Study Podcast is funny, insightful, and kind of weird. And it's guaranteed to help you become the most interesting person at parties. Listen to the Culture Study Podcast every Wednesday, wherever you get your shows. Hi, Megan. Welcome to podcast. We haven't even said the intro. No one's. How could oh. anyone know that a podcast has commenced when we haven't even said the magic words? Because I, <laughs> I said, "Hi, Megan. Welcome to podcast." Nobody knows what. Nobody knows what that means. Nobody knows what that means. Text me back. Text me back. Text me back at once. Why won't you text me back? Text. Me text me back. Text me back, back. Megan. This is Text Me Back, a podcast about best friends, the best animals, and the worst people. I'm Megan Hatcher Mays. And I'm Lindy West. Welcome to podcast. Welcome, friend. And podcast be with you. (laughs) And also (laughs) podcast with you. Coming up. Coming up, I say. Coming up on today's show, we're talking to a Supreme Court expert. Oh, and it's not me. It's my friend, Doug Lindner. From League of Conservation Voters. And then I'm talking to aliens, maybe. But before all that, it's tidings. Uh, <laughs> listen, I feel like we haven't had a proper catch up in some time. I know. Like, Hunt's is a little too sweet for me. Mm-hmm. I feel like I like a classic Heinz mm-hmm. <laughs> catch up. Yeah. Um, but real talk, though, the Trader Joe's ketchup is, should be banned in all 50 yeah. states and the territories. It tastes like sugarcane. It's disgusting. Um, okay, I want to tell you about what's been going on with me. I want to tell you my tidings. Your tidings? My tidings. Tidings, tidings. Time for more delicious tidings. The tidings today come from Megan Hatcher Mays and I don't know what they're gonna be. Oh, that's so nice. That was almost like a little rhyme in there. Okay, listen. Uh, you know, it's Oscar season, Duder. You know this because of your famous movie blog. In my famous movie blog, Butt News, I watch <laughs> all the Oscar contenders, such That's as right. The Secret of Nim and <laughs> <laughs> Center Stage. That was a Center big Center Stage yeah. and mm-hmm. Shallow Hell. Mm-hmm. Who's going to take home the gold? All of the above. It's going to be a three-way <laughs> tie. Congrats. Congrats to Peter Gallagher. Um, Okay, so anyways, every year I try this is, uh, I think the most millennial thing I do. I don't know. But I try to see all of the Oscar contenders, especially at the very least, I want to see all of the best picture nominees. Mm -hmm. Um, So just so I can have like an, uh, an, like an educated complaint when I'm yelling at my screen when the white man wins, I would, you know, so I can be like, this is based on the merits and not just because I don't think white men deserve things, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, because you definitely don't think that. I definitely don't think that. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I went and I saw Killers of the Flower Moon, directed by noted Caucasian Martin Scorsese. And boy, was that movie the longest film in the history of cinema. I feel like such a Philistine when I complain about the length of movies, but this mf was like three and a half hours long, bro. Deep into hour two, I'm like, okay, please. Ma- Martin? Three hours long? Three hours plus, three and a half. Almost what? four. Are you joking me? I, I am not pulling your leg. This is not a jape, friend. This is real serious Oscar business. Um, it was three and a half hours long. Here's the thing. The story is so interesting. It's basically about how... Um, the Osage in Oklahoma basically hit riches. They found oil on their land and they became some of the wealthiest people in the entire United States and white people not content to let people of color mind their own business. were like, Ooh, how can we steal all of that? So basically the core story is really fascinating. It's about how, um, you know, white people would marry into these Osage families to get land rights. And there was a series of devastating murders because that was one of the only ways that you could get the land rights was to inherit them. Um, There's a lot of murders, not just of 
women, like indigenous women whose families had long owned these land rights, but sometimes their children, so that they would be inherited by white people. Now, how do you take that and turn it into the most boring movie I ever, I've ever seen? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I don't know how he did it. That is in and of itself an achievement. So shouts to Martin. Shouts to Marty. So here's what I'll say. The woman in it, Lily Gladstone, a great Seattle company, by the way. I believe she's from Western Washington. Um, anyway, the woman in it, Lily Gladstone, was nominated for Best Actress, the first Indigenous actress to do so, I, I believe. And she's great. She's so good in it. And I hope she wins. But I'm sitting there like, get Leonardo DiCaprio's weird jowls up out of here. Martin Scorsese is dazzled by Leo and his jowls. He can't get enough. You know? So here's what I'll say. The movie, very long, very boring, except for Lily Gladstone, who richly deserves her Best yeah. Actress nomination. And I will be rooting for her. Now, here's what was happening to me. Three and a half hours in, I'm like, well, well, it was like three hours and 18 minutes in. I was like, well, I don't know why I thought this. And by the way, there's no way to verify that this happened, but it did, I promise. I was like, at least Martin Scorsese isn't one of those directors who insists on putting himself in his own movies. Because oh, yes, that, he is. <laughs> that would end my life. That would, that would actually send me to the hospital. As I am thinking it, Martin Scorsese appears on the big screen as a radio host telling the story of these Osage women and children who had been murdered. And I was like, Martin, let me go. If you must be Peter Jackson at the Prancing Pony or whatever, where it pans across your face, glugging an ale. Don't <laughs> yeah. give yourself lines. Don't, give Don't make yourself, yourself into a weird framing device. That is atrocious. It was unbelievable. I was like, yeah, be like Alfred Hitchcock. You're putting up a suitcase on the train. You're, you're Peter Jackson. You're taking a big old bite out of a carrot or something. Yep. You're you know? waiting for but the bus. Not radio host, not 1920s radio host. I'm trying to live. I was already hanging on by a thread and this man comes trotting across my screen. <laughs> Can I just ask for one thing, one favor? Yes. Can I mm -hmm. get just a... Uh, 10 second impression of Marty as the radio host in the movie talking about the <laughs> ladies. You know what? It was like your classic, they're committing crimes in Oklahoma, see? <laughs> Listen here. They were they were taking the money in the land rights, see? And it was a problem. Perfect. Ah, I'm 100% perfect. sure that's how it went. Take and if you've seen Killers of the Flower Moon, I don't want to hear from you about it. I don't. <laughs> Do not text the BFF text club about it because you know that impression is spot on. You know it is. <laughs> okay, so we have a story about white men stealing, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. Then a white man steals the story to make a movie about it. <laughs> yes. So that he can steal the awards <laughs> for it. And then also he steals airtime. It's like then even in the movie the fictionalized movie about the thing a white man gets to tell the story on the radio in the universe of the movie that a white man made to his credit he did work very closely with the tribes who were involved in this story so that is very nice and very good really i think making more effort than anyone in a long time has done to try to tell the story as faithfully as possible with that said very tired very tired at the very least, give me Jesse Plemons earlier than two hours and 45 minutes into the film. You know what? I stand Plemons. And I, I'll, get, I'll take all the Plemons you got. I'll take all the Jesse Plemons you got. Don't shuffle him out hours into this thing to, like as a carrot to keep me engaged, Marty. When life gives you Plemons, make Plemonade from make th minute one of the film. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Uh, sorry to be an uncultured turd, but that movie is too long, but I hope Lily Gladstone wins. And if I yeah. ever, if I ever see Martin Scorsese come trotting across my giant screen while I'm trying to enjoy my little french fries at my movie theater that delivers food to my seat, it's curtains for you, Marty. It's curtains for you. <laughs> okay, Paul. Okay. Lindy, your tidings? I'm dying to hear them. So... I was recently home alone for a week. I live in a large log cabin in the woods. 
built by a hermit who died on the property. Who knows what kind kind of ghosts are here? Is that true? Yeah. Oh, I never knew that. Oh, you don't know about Old Man Donald? I don't know about Old Man Donald. Oh. Well, we'll okay, talk well. about it in a future episode. Teaser alert. Teaser. But this is not about the ghost of Old Man Donald, I don't think. But it is about a ghost. So I'm home alone. There's a whole like wing of the house. Well, that makes it sound like it's a museum size. <laughs> but, like Basically, like when I'm here by myself, I just stay kind of in the cozy front part of the house. There's like a bedroom and a TV room, and that's where the kitchen is. And I don't need to go into the back where Mm-mm. there's sort of a another bedroom and a a living room with a fireplace and it's um the older part of the house that mr donald built i mean it's my favorite part of the house but i don't go there by myself it's sure. drafty you gotta warm it up blah 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 yeah. blah. well and you do and you have you have bats and that's where the bats live indeed and we had our first bat sighting of the season just <laughs> this week so i was like eh, i'm gonna just keep the door closed i don't need to go back there so i hadn't been back there all week and then uh i went in there to do something i don't know get something i'm just walking through the room i had grabbed the book or whatever i wanted to get and i was heading back toward the door to the kitchen and then on the piano is a tiny is a cute little framed photograph of my grandmother holding my dad as a baby and i'm i'm 10 feet from the piano this thing pitches frontward off the piano onto the piano onto the piano keys and it goes so loud (laughs) and i was like what was that i thought maybe one of the piano strings snapped like oh yeah or something that's what it sounded like it was so loud and i was like what is what is that and then i went over there and i realized that picture was on the floor and it had fallen onto the key one just one one key i wish i knew what note it was oh and i feel like and by the way this piano it belonged to my great grandmother florence great grandma flo Mm -hmm. and the portrait that fell was of florence's daughter winnie my grandma (gasps) winnie and so grandma winnie's ghost pitched her photo onto one of the keys of great grandma flo's piano yes i'm gonna say just to say hi and maybe yeah. my dad was there too. Yeah, and so maybe then it I- wasn't scary. Maybe it wasn't yeah. scary. Yeah. I chose to have it not be scary. I said, hi, Grandma Winnie, who, you know, and like Great Grandma Flo, Grandma Winnie, I didn't know them. Mm-hmm. Like Great Grandma Flo died like j- decades before I was born. Grandma Winnie died when I was like a baby. Yeah. So I was just, I just said hi to them and I was like, I'm so glad you're here. That's nice. And it was actually a really nice moment, but it was very dramatic. Yeah, it's very dramatic. It's like they're sending you tidings from beyond. Yes. Their That's tiding so nice. was bong. <laughs> <laughs> Their tiding was the scariest chord that you can play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then that 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 encounter actually launched me into a new obsession, which is, or one might call it a destructive fixation, which is that now I cannot get off of Ancestry.com. I am clicking and <laughs> clicking and clicking. Yeah, so now I'm an Ancestry head. You're sending your DNA to websites. You don't care. You don't care. Oh, billion percent. Do not care. <laughs> anyway, so that's my tiding. I had a ghost. You know, I, I honestly, I don't think I have had a ghost encounter before. Yeah, this is definitely one, Ever in my life. And definitely. It's, and it's really cute that they're just saying, what's up? I know. Bong. Yeah. Bong. <laughs> that's how you say it in piano. Up next, we dig into the true crime details of teeny tiny aliens that are hanging out in Peru. Guess what? Text Me Back is going live. Friday, March 15th, 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. at Town Hall, Seattle. We'll talk about our favorite animals, our least favorite people. We'll share our tidings, play a game or two, and maybe even bring some songs and other surprises for this special live podcast event. You can check KOW.org for events. Or check the show notes for today's show. See you then, besties. This podcast is free, and it's accessible to everyone, thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, 
please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give, and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks! So, Megan, we talked about some stuff that you're an expert about, and now it's time to get into my expertise. (laughs) And this is an area that I'm shocked to realize we have not covered yet on this podcast. We've talked about ghosts. We've talked about vampires. We've talked about snakes. We've talked Mm -hmm. about sharks. We've talked about Sasquatch. We've talked about cryptids. (laughs) Not one mention of aliens. Uh, not one mention of UFOs, not one mention of tiny little men from hmm. space. So This is intergalactic erasure. Yeah, absolutely. So the story, you'll be familiar with it. It came out last year, 2023. Scientists in Mexico unveiled what they believe to be alien corpses. They were found in Peru back in 2017. They are estimated to be 1,000 years old. And experts say one of the bodies has eggs inside of it. Hmm. Maybe we're going to have alien babies. A lot going on in Peru. Yeah. A UFOlogist <laughs> appeared. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. That's, okay. that's, that's his title? Really? That's UFologist? his title. UFOlogist? Okay. UFOlogist. Okay, okay, please continue. I'm so sorry. A self-described UFOlogist. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that there's a university conferring degrees in UFOlogy. But this this guy named Jaime Mausan, Mexican journalist and self described ufologist, he <laughs> uh, he comes forward and he's like, "You guys, I <laughs> have some huge news. I have found the preserved corpses of tiny little alien boys," <laughs> and he presents them in front of the. Mexican Congress, oh, oh, which would have been a huge deal if they had been uh, shown to be authentic, because then then Mexico would be the first country to formally recognize extraterrestrial life. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. This is actually the second time that this ufologist has presented a non-human body corpse to the Mexican Congress. <laughs> in- <laughs> oh my god! He tried this in 2015. He was like, "Hey." I found this mummy. It's clearly an alien. Look how weird it is. It's all skinny and scrunched up. It's got a we- kind of a weird head. And then they were like, yeah, it's the mummified corpse of a human child. This is so perverted that you brought this to Congress and tried to use it to pump up your ufologist business. Oh, but then they let him come back? He was undeterred. He came back. He was like, okay, that one was too much like a person. I gotta go littler and weirder. <laughs> yeah, more scrunched up. These little guys, <laughs> they're like, I don't know, 18 inches tall. And they really look like E.T. Yeah. It, like, it's giving E.T. It's giving weird glowing finger. Um, and so he comes back and he's like, yeah, we found these in Peru. And they're these ones, he's like, look, I learned from experience from last time. Fool me once. <laughs> Can't get fooled again. I know <laughs> that these ones are definitely real. This was huge news. Set the globe on fire. People were so excited about these aliens. They're so funny looking. They're... To me, what I love about them is that they look like the opposite of those um, is it cake videos because (laughs) they look like cake, (laughs) except it is dolls with bones, dolls filled with bones. It is not aliens, according to scientists. (laughs) Terrestrial bones, not from space. (laughs) Terrestrial bones of humans. Oh, Flavio Estrada a scientist with Peru's prosecutor's office. He says, they are not extraterrestrials. They are not intra-terrestrials. They are not a new species. They are not hybrids. They are none of those things that this group of pseudoscientists who for six years have been presenting with these elements. They're prosecuting this man for bringing doll bones to Congress? No. No, I think they're just grumpy about it. (laughs) They're just annoyed. This is from CBS News. 
It says, the humanoid three-fingered dolls consisted of earthbound animal and human bones assembled oh. with, with modern synthetic glue. <laughs> oh, no. So it's unclear if Jaime himself got a bunch of bones together and glued them into the shape of a little man and then brought them before um, Mexican Congress. But, but I mean, it's clear to me. It's clear to, it's clear to clear me to <laughs> what happened here. You know, it looks like paper mache. I mean, it's the <laughs> it's the least convincing. It looks like I made it in fifth grade. Oh, my God. But yeah, and then it doesn't even have the decency to be cake. I know. It's really, it's like, you know, when you're watching those videos, it's like, oh, my God, it is a shoe. And then the knife glides right through. And mm-hmm. that's Jaime and his animal and potentially yeah. human bones glued together Except- with gorilla glue. I except I don't want to eat a slice no. of bones <laughs> of bones and glue. I want a slice of cake. Make fake aliens cake again. That's what Why I have to say. Why doesn't Jaime just open a bakery? He should start a new TikTok trend instead of is it cake, is it bones? Where we show sh- <laughs> we show pictures of cake and then you slice into it inside just bones. <laughs> just bones. <laughs> What's so frustrating about this is that I don't totally really believe in ghosts. Um, as stated, I don't believe in Sasquatch, even though I I know I had a ghost encounter just this week with my sweet yeah. grandma Winnie. But well, that one was real. That was real. That one was real. <laughs> but I uh, I do believe in aliens, of course. I, I mean, the of I course. don't think they're here walking around. I don't think they have two little legs and three long fingers like a tiny man, because that would be absolutely insane. But um the nature of infinity dictates that there must be creatures out there. The thing, here's where Jaime went wrong. You can't make your fake alien look like the most famous cinematic alien of all time. Don't make it look like the extraterrestrial. You can't just be like, Con- confirmed. Steven Spielberg's guess was correct. This is what they look like. That's wild. You can't do that, Jaime. But also, moving on, you're right. There's absolutely aliens uh, out there because the universe is vast beyond our tiny brain's understanding. It simply cannot be the case that humans, stinky, dirty, smelly humans who do bad things all the time are the only things going on in this universe of ours. No chance. But I don't, I'm not so sure that they're like even zooming around in ships. No, at this stage, no, they're yeah. probably like little worms. Yeah, on a like that live in a fire. Yeah, probably you know? they might have soci- little worm societies or whatever, like worm That'll bureaucracy. Be so cute. Yeah, That'll be so little cute. worm government. I would love to meet them, but yeah, I guess you know how I feel about ufologists. It's sort of the same as I feel about cryptids. It's like the the potential and then the follow through don't match. I know. It's like. I I want this to be real. This could be real. This is very uh, interesting and like tasty to me. I want to mm-hmm. take a big bite out of this story. And then it's always just like a con man who I made know. a little doll out of bones. It's annoying. Well, it's because people don't want a, just a little worm and a little worm society. They don't want space worm. They want like, you I know, do. spooky alien domination, which I don't want. I don't want that. I don't want a story about that. I want to know about space worm democracy. That's what I want. I just want to know what's true, you know? Yeah. Wait, I just thought of something. What if Jaime, like, what if it's not a scam? He really thought that that both of the guys were real. Like, I don't want to totally blame Jaime in case he's just really like, he wants to believe. He's like Mulder, Fox Mulder. Yeah. That's the Jaime that I want to believe in. It's like when... uh, my dad got married four times. I always think about like, yeah, I'm going to try this again. This you know? time it's aliens. This time it's aliens. <laughs> what a sweet optimism that is. <laughs> so keep up the good work, Jaime. Yeah. Hang in there, pal. Coming up after the break, we're getting into the Supreme Court weeds and the sea with a VIP from Swamp Town. The seaweeds. The seaweeds. This show, Text Me Back, uh, is mostly about Oprah, 
ghosts and buttercream frosting, but we wanted to invite on a special guest on today to get into the weeds a little bit about a Supreme Court case. Uh, You may have heard of it. Sometimes it's called Loper Bright. We're going to be calling it Relentless, which is another name for the case and also how I feel about the Supreme Court. Um, This case seems really innocuous on the surface, but actually it has very broad implications for the, I don't know, functioning of our government. And so we've brought a special guest on to talk to us about it. That special guest is Doug Lindner of League of Conservation Voters. Before we get into Relentless, can you please tell us who are you, Doug? How do we know each other? And what do you do for the League of Conservation Voters, also known as LCB? Also, what is that? And also, what is that? Yes, I am Doug Lindner, and I am Senior Director of Judiciary and Democracy at the League of Conservation Voters, also known as LCB, which is one of the nation's largest environmental organizations. Um, We do a lot of work to support uh, our good climate policy, clean water conservation, and uh, a healthy democracy through the political process. We do a fair bit of work in elections as well. And until recently, Megan was my counterpart at Indivisible, <laughs> leading an, a, a fellow progressive organization's democracy policy. Really quickly, can we get on the record, was I good at my job? You were very good at your job. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> okay, Doug, lay it on me. <laughs> what is this terrifying case, aka relentless, which I don't like the sound of that, and how will a negative outcome impact... New York Times bestselling authors who live in the woods named me. <laughs> so first, congratulations on the book. Um, <laughs> oh, it came out in 2016. I haven't been on the list again. But you, you get to put that on every future book on the cover. And that's really Literally, thing, right? I sure yes. do. And I sure will. <laughs> so The Relentless Case, also known as Loper Bright, is a case in which the Supreme Court is considering overturning or substantially scaling back the most important judicial precedent that most people have never heard of. It's called the Chevron Doctrine. It comes from a 40-year-old case called Chevron v. NRDC. And this is about administrative law, which sounds boring, but I promise it's not, and I'll explain why. This case has been cited in more court decisions to decide more court decisions than any other case you can think of. It comes up more often than Brown v. Board of Education, more than Roe v. Wade, more than any other case they will come to mind, uh, because it is fundamental to the ability of public interest agencies across the federal government, touching not just environment, which is my area, but every area of public policy to protect the people from powerful special interests. It is about the balance of power between the experts and agency leaders and presidential appointees at those expert agencies like the EPA, as well as the elected president and the elected Congress and the voters, the balance of power between all of those people on one side and on the other side, just the Supreme Court. And if you're picturing nine people on the Supreme Court, uh uh-uh, six. (laughs) Because however we might feel in the abstract about the balance of power between courts and other branches of government, this particular Supreme Court that has a six to three lock on the court, that has life tenure, that can and often does strategically retire when their side is in the White House, means that we know and they, the justices themselves, know that more power in the hands of the Supreme Court itself means more power in the hands of big business and uh, of the justices themselves who are taking a lot of lavish gifts from those same uh, special interests. They don't have the thing where you can only take a present that you can hold in your hand like a risotto ball. (laughs) Yeah, like a canapé. (laughs) They don't have that restriction because Megan said she had that restriction. Well, yeah, like like the house ethics rules or like the congressional ethics rules are like you can't give somebody like a sit down dinner, but like little canapés are okay. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to give you like a, a, you know, I know this is, sounds like I'm splitting hairs here, but here's the distinction we're making. When Megan was a congressional staffer, she couldn't accept gifts of food from lobbyists if it involved sitting down or if you're standing up, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're a Supreme Court justice, then it's okay if a billionaire owns your mother's house and lets her live there for free. <laughs> That's right. That's correct. He's not right? joking. <laughs> I get it because the stakes are way lower for a Supreme Court For, for sure. Justice. Exactly. So basically how things work now yeah. is that the courts defer to federal agencies' Mm -hmm. expertise when they're like writing rules or regulations about how they want to administer the laws that Congress passes that dictate how they do things. So that includes health and human services, that includes the Labor Department, that includes every single federal agency you can imagine. Um, There's all these laws that passed by Congress that say, here's how you operate. But the agencies themselves can say, okay, well, in my expertise as a scientist who works at the EPA says this is the best way to regulate clean air. And up till this point, the court has says we defer to you because we're just nine idiots that went to law school 
you guys are scientists or you're a labor expert or whatever the case may be. But so what's at risk of happening in this case is the court saying, actually, we decide because we are six unelected kings. Is that right? Yeah. So imagine that there's a new law and we'll call it the Pollution Act of 2024. And the Pollution Act is administered by the EPA. <laughs> and it's and there's some ambiguity in the law. Any Anyone would say it's it's ambiguous in this. And so usually under Chevron, when there's an ambiguity in a law like that that's administered by an expert agency like the EPA, and the EPA or whatever the agency is has a reasonable interpretation of the ambiguity, courts are supposed to let the agency keep their reasonable interpretation and work on that. Imagine we have this fake law, the Pollution Act of 2024. It's ambiguous. And with Chevron, the agency can look at that and try to figure out what, how it should be implemented, what that ambiguous provision should mean. And they can think about that based on the science, based on their expertise, based on their understanding of the government's ability to deliver on specific uh, deliverables, based on cost-benefit analysis, and the preferences of elected officials like the president, the Congress, governors and mayors in some situations, interested parties, and members of the general public who can participate in formal notice and comment process as anyone can, and it's free and easy, and you can do it online if you're really interested in any regulation from any agency. There's a lot of that process. So there's so many factors, even more than I've just named, so many factors that they can uh, bring in and so much deliberation about what is the right thing to do. But without Chevron, it is the judges deciding it. And judges are not qualified to consider any of those factors, especially the science, by the way. As a lawyer, I'm telling you, (laughs) judges are not qualified to consider the science. So without any of those factors I just mentioned, and if we know that the law is ambiguous, because if a judge says the law is ambiguous, which is how Chevron works... When they say the law is ambiguous, that is them telling you the skill set of judges and lawyers is not well suited to deciding what should happen. Mm -hmm. So what's left, if they're not qualified to make the decision and consider the factors that an agency would, what's left is their ideology. It's their political preferences and and their personal preferences and those of their allies and benefactors. It literally can come down to the personal financial interests of the justices and their benefactors. And so in this case, for example, this relentless case is being paid for by big oil. The lawyers who brought this case are on the payroll of the Koch political network paid for by Charles Koch, the the CEO of the nation's largest privately held oil company, one of the richest men in the world, and one of the biggest spenders in politics. Justice Clarence Thomas, among many ethical scandals, (laughs) has been speaking at political fundraisers for the Koch political network and hanging out at Charles Koch at exclusive, like, rich guy club retreats. And also, Justice Samuel Alito is married to someone who leases oil drilling land to an oil company. And both of them are not recusing. Just like both of them did not recuse from last year's big case that gutted the Clean Water Act, and both of them did not recuse from the previous year's case Mm -hmm. gutting EPA authority on climate. And so what I'm getting at here is it's not great, and I have some concerns about these people. (laughs) Okay, so to to rephrase one more time in idiot's terms, (laughs) they would defer... To, for example, a lobster scientist, but then in the future, they defer to whoever buys them the biggest, fattest lobster to eat. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's about deferring to whoever buys them the biggest lobster. Sometimes it's just their own personal hot takes, right? Just whatever they feel like. It's whatever they feel. It's it's vibes. It is the classic vibes doctrine. (laughs) That, you know, that feels very, very Trumpy. Like, I feel like Trumpy was a very, Trump was a very vibes based president. Yeah. You know? And these are a lot of his picks. You know, he picked three of these people. So I love that. I love that. You know, there is a famous line from uh, a past Supreme Court justice. I think it was Robert Jackson who said of the Supreme Court, we are not in final because we're infallible. We are infallible because we're final. And that is a scary thing because they are final. And uh, it's difficult to have people who think they're infallible when in fact they are nearly always wrong. (laughs) i really love that we had doug on to talk to us about this case i feel so good (laughs) when are we gonna see megan and doug on the bench (laughs) not with this podcast imagine josh holly reading out the transcript of our podcast about about rat ghosts look i i think one of the most important things that we need from judges that we don't have right now is people who can check their political opinions at the door And I cannot check any of my opinions anywhere. So I will not be a judge. It's the judiciary's loss, Doug. (laughs) Okay, Doug, last question. And probably the most important question of the day. Indeed, indeed. Who's the nicest person in Congress and who's the meanest? (laughs) You don't have to to Uh, really answer. You can say who's the nicest. Who's the nicest? Um, You know, I... 
I, I'm not going to give a superlative to it, but one member of Congress who I really enjoyed talking to relatively recently was Lisa Blunt Rochester. And I'm giving her this shout out for being super. So she is a congresswoman from Delaware and is likely to be Delaware's next U.S. senator. And when she gets there, will be one of maybe the only black woman in the Senate, but certainly one of few when she gets there. And I'm giving her this shout out, not just because she's amazing in general, but because I saw her at an event like last month and she laughed at one of my jokes. Therefore, I find her to be very nice. (laughs) You know what? That's so relatable. Good answer, Doug. Doug, do you know what Megan said when I asked her that question? (laughs) Can you, do you know? Uh, she spilled some tea about someone who's really mean. <laughs> no, oh, no. She I, said, who is the nicest in Congress? And Megan's pick was? It was, it was Mark Meadows. <laughs> Megan, hang, hang on, hang on. The, the nicest member of Congress cannot be someone who conspired to get the rest of them killed. Well, he wasn't a conspiracist then. I just think it's important for your listeners to hear, you heard it here first, the official position of the Text Me Back podcast is that Mark Meadows is awesome and unproblematic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm surprised to hear it, but now it's set in stone. You know, if this podcast is nothing if not um, honest and truthful. <laughs> and extremely right wing. Doug, thank you for being our third ever guest, our second non-wizard guest, and thank you for being our guide through the weeds of Supreme Court despair. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Megan and Lindy. It has been a pleasure. Um, That said, I never said I wasn't a wizard, and I will see you in court for that. (laughs) You've heard it here first. Doug is our second wizard guest. All right. Thanks, guys. Did, 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 did we have him? Doug! (laughs) Outro music. Megan, I gotta say, another flawless piece of radio. It was a masterpiece. I've already contacted Le Louvre. (laughs) (laughs) We're we're redefining the business. I know. Every day. So next week, I'm actually going to be on vacation. What? Is that allowed? I don't know. We're not employees of KOW, so we can do whatever (laughs) we want. They can tell me not to go on vacation when they give me health insurance. (laughs) When they give me the keys to all things considered. (laughs) But I'm going to the Midwest and I'm going to sit next to a fire on the shores of Lake Michigan. Such a brave choice since the current temperature at Lake Michigan is not measurable by modern thermometers. Here's the thing. Counterpoint. If you go on vacation to the shores of Lake Michigan in February... The hotel rooms are half off. (laughs) The hotel gives you $5 to come. (laughs) So that's what I'm going to do. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to have an episode next week. It doesn't mean that. It's true. It's going to be a real cutie. You're going to hear some cute little things you may never have heard of from the Text Me Back universe back when we were in our tin can era. We have lots of stuff in the vault from before we got professional microphones when we were piloting the show. It's going to be really cute. It's actually probably going to be your favorite episode because it's when we were at our most unhinged and uh, giddy and we weren't, you know, ground down into dust by the podcast (laughs) grind. Oh my God. (laughs) Yes, that's right. Next week is going to be the Turkish delight of Mm. podcasts. (laughs) Tune in, won't you? Thank you so much for listening to Text Me Back. If you like the show, please tell your best friend about us and rate and review us. It helps people find the show. Text Me Back is a production of KUOW in Seattle, a proud member of the NPR network. Our editor is Jeannie Yandel. Our senior producer is Brandy Fullwood. Our mixer is Jason Burrows. Diana Bowen makes our video clips and they are delightful. I'm not just saying that because we're in them. Go enjoy them at Text Me Back Pod on Instagram and TikTok. Our production team includes Michaela Giannotti Boyle, Amelia Peacock, Alicia Villa, Hans Twight, Brendan Sweeney, and Marshall Eisen. Our music is by Chief Aha Mefile J. Oluo. Special thanks to our perfect angel, Azolda Raftery. I'm Lindy West. And I'm Megan Hatcher Mays. See you next week. At a time when information continues to come at us faster and faster, sometimes you need to hit pause and rewind. 
NPR's Throughline takes you back in time to the source of the news stories filling your feed. Find NPR's Throughline wherever you get your podcasts.